Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Gordon, for inviting me. My name is Toya. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Grateful to be here, and it's an honor and a privilege to be invited to come and share here at, the, at this meeting. And it's an honour and a privilege to be anywhere. I'm grateful to be alive, to be sober, and I owe that to Alcoholics Anonymous I'm here in Perth, Western Australia. And my sobriety date is the 26th of March, 1994. Such is the power of this program. And my home group is the Rockingham People's Group. I'm a regular attendee at our Sunday night Steps and Traditions meeting. Welcome uh, to the newcomers and especially to the person here at their first ever meeting. Wow. To me, that that, that adds a, a layer of specialness to be in this meeting. And I certainly remember my first meeting very clearly, even though it was 27 years ago, because my life changed on that day. And um, as, as we were having a chat before the meeting, it is 4 a.m. here in Perth and I've stopped saying I'm not a morning person because nowadays um, I just sleep when I'm tired. I wake up when I need to wake up and when I'm asked to do something in AA, I say yes whenever possible. And what I find uh, repeatedly, my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is the more I try to give the more the abundance rains on me and I get all just all kinds of things come to me, but I'm not motivated by that. My motivation is I need to do this to stay alive and to stay well. Alcoholism is uh, a fatal and progressive illness, although I am recovered. And I know that when I say recovered, I think sometimes people get upset about that, but that's okay. That's not my business. This is my truth and my reality. And these are the promises of Alcoholics Anonymous that have come true for me. I was told at my first meeting 27 years ago, you can leave this room. You need never drink again if you so desire. But what I need to add to that is, and if you continue to work, if you work at this program and continue to work at it, or more more accurately, um, practice the principles of this program and live this way of life because it's actually not an abstinence from alcohol program it's a spiritual program it's a way of living that allows me to be happy joyous and free and uh, so I don't know what's going to happen here while I'm sharing I might laugh I might cry I'll probably talk out of the big book or the literature but um, what really qualifies me here is uh, my experience as an alcoholic and uh, you know I spoke to a work colleague the other day and she has a master's degree in addictions and I don't say this with any ego or or any arrogance and I didn't say it to her but just for me personally it's like well I have 12 years experience as a practicing alcoholic and you can't get that at a university you can't buy that and uh, but it nearly cost me my life and it cost me a lot but Alcoholics Anonymous has repaid me in full with interest anything and everything that alcohol took from me. So 12 years of a drinking career, which I, when I came to AA, I mourned the loss of my teenage years, my early 20s, uh, the loss of my self-respect and dignity, the loss of friendships, opportunities. Uh, My other drug use, I feared, had maybe caused me some brain damage or something. I was... um, yeah, quite worried about my functioning when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, so I felt a lot of grief, sadness, self-pity. I never would have imagined uh, using that word to describe myself of being in self-pity because I felt justified uh, at my victim stance. And again, victim stance is not something I would have used or victimhood because I had a terrible childhood. And if you'd been through what I'd been through, you would drink too and you'd be angry and sad too. And that's not to minimise terrible things that happen to people, but there comes a time as a grown-up, as an adult, when I do need to get over it and get on with my life and stop blaming my parents. And so Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to not just be free free from alcohol, but to grow up. 
and that was something I balked at in the beginning. And so my, uh, I always felt different. I don't know if I was born an alcoholic or if I became an alcoholic and I don't care. I'm not interested in ever, ever debating or even really discussing that with anyone. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing for me. All I need to do is look at that 12 years of experience, look at the facts of my case, which is that 12 years drinking. And uh, so I felt different. Was it because I was a migrant? I was born in Finland, came out to Australia. Was it because I grew up with alcoholism and violence in my home? Was it this? Was it that? I don't know. I just felt different. And uh, when I first uh, drank alcohol, somewhere around the age of 14, I remember getting drunk and my brother had said to me, I'm never going to drink. Promise you're never going to drink as well. And I, I refused that kind of promise. Even as a child, I thought, no, 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 because I saw the fun that people had when they were drinking and I wanted that. They seemed to have a release and freedom from care and boredom and worry. I wanted that. There was something about that. But I didn't want the other stuff, the police, the ambulances, the fights, the, the screaming and yelling and the problems. I didn't want that. So it's like, I'm going to drink, but I'm not going to do that. And uh, when I, but I couldn't understand, I saw my father drink and I thought, why does he do that? He's okay, like, he's okay when he doesn't drink mostly. But uh, but when I first got drunk at about the age of 14, it was like the lights came on, a massive big aha moment. This is why he drinks. I feel good. That feeling of self-consciousness and uncomfortability and not fitting in and being different it all just went away I felt good so I couldn't wait to do it again so alcoholism really had me in its grip from an early age and some of the kids even at 14 made jokes about my drinking made jokes about me being an alcoholic and I just thought everyone drank like that some did some didn't and so I started school as a straight A student. Uh, by the time I dropped out of high school, um, my grades had dropped considerably and I just felt like it was no point going to school anymore because I'm a perfectionist. If I can't be the best, I don't want to do it at all. And I remember even at, uh, we had started to learn tennis at high school and because I couldn't hit the ball the first time or straight away be good at it and be the best, I just refused simply refuse to participate after that uh, dreadful attitude to have and one that's going to keep me in all kinds of poverty that kind of closed-mindedness and unwillingness to have a go at things and um, what else so back in that was the mid 80s or mid to late 80s and it was easy easy uh, here in Perth to get work to get by in life so away I went got a job with the government and back then you couldn't get the sack no matter what you did you were set for life so I was protected in that sense financially with my work. And I worked uh, to fund my alcohol drinking, really. And I hated my job and um, hated everything and everyone, really. I was very, very negative and disconnected. And, and as I described before, very sad and lonely and um, full of, full of uh, self-pity and so on. Um, but I thought I'd found something in booze and drugs and I, I hung out with an older crowd. They had money and cars and drugs and booze and the party lifestyle and I wanted that and and continued on for the next 10 years or so. And uh, I remember one particular one particular episode, I was up on a geographical up in Darwin, Northern Territory, which is probably the drinking capital of Australia, and I was about 19 and I'd, we'd been going to a party and my first, uh, you know, first question is how much alcohol are they going to have there? Is it BYO? Is the alcohol provided? And they said, there's going to be punch there. Immediately I thought there's not going to be enough. It's not going to be strong enough. These people just don't know how to provide alcohol. So I bought a great big bottle of gin and thought I better take this with me because I'm going to need this. And so I drank some of the punch, um, I drank the gin, didn't want to share the gin with anyone. And uh, the next morning I came to, we were living in a caravan park at the time, I came to in a caravan, some people were kind of standing over me, looking at me, worried. I, don't, I, I think they wondered whether I was going to wake up or not. 
I saw the bottle of gin, a, a 750 ml bottle of gin with a tiny bit left in the bottom. And um, my boyfriend said to me, oh, you said last night you said you're never going to drink again. And I I was just shocked and horrified. I said, no, 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 I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't say that. What I would have meant is I'll never touch vodka again. But it doesn't matter today um, what it is, top shelf, bottom shelf, uh, how much I drink or who I drink with, where I drink, um, Park Avenue, the park bench. It's the fact that I have an allergy to alcohol and I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. Um, through the years, as my drinking progressed, uh, the facade of normality was there. I managed to hold down that job. Uh, I'd been raised with a strong work ethic. My parents were hard workers, um, working class people. And so I managed to pay my bills. The facade of normality was there, but inside I was dying and I didn't know I was dying from alcoholism so much. I know today only as a result of being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and finding out what was wrong with me because towards the end of my drinking, the question went around and round in my mind constantly, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? And I had this terrible fear, this uh, gnawing feeling inside that there's something wrong with me and it was really frightening. And so, um, yeah, and I remember another time trying to control my drinking. I had lost my driver's licence at one point. There was a couple of other charges. It was an ugly scene, resisting arrest, um, assault. Uh, today I don't, I don't have any fear or shame or embarrassment about this. It was 30 years ago. It's a long time, and these things have not prevent, prevented me ever from achieving or doing anything else in life. And, in fact, God will use these things as assets. God will use all of my past as a way to help others. That 12-year drinking career to date is my greatest asset. It's none of the material stuff or the education or anything that's been given to me as a, as a result of being a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and putting in work, having a go at things. AA has taught me you can do anything, just try. One day at a time you can do anything. And so I remember um, I'd been in trouble with the law, um, a lot of uh, shame and embarrassment and uh, doing and saying things, guilt, shame and remorse, waking up the next morning after a binge, what happened, uh, sometimes uh, remembering bits and pieces of the night before in patches as I went in and out of the blackout, remembering some things I wish I didn't remember, having memory blanks of not knowing what happened, how did I get home, all these kind of things. And I remember um, just trying to think of one or two examples, I guess, to show my powerlessness because step one admitted we were powerless over alcohol. We, so step one, we, this is a we program. There's a fellowship here. I can't, we can. I can't do it alone. I need a higher power. I need a fellowship. I need an instruction manual, which is our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And... Um, I didn't want to, I couldn't imagine that I was powerless. I didn't know anything about these words like powerlessness or anything. I just thought I need to control it, of course. I, I need to, um, I knew that any more than two standard drinks could be a risk to your health. So I thought you can have two drinks. So I went to a party, had two drinks with me, two cans. It's probably more than two standard drinks, actually, these cans of mixed drinks. But what I noticed in myself was that my mind was obsessed constantly. Um, I, I was halfway through the first can. I've still got one and a half cans left. And I was just kind of keeping it together. And I couldn't enjoy myself. I couldn't dance. I couldn't really converse with people. I couldn't do anything. All I could think about is, okay, now I've finished the first can. I've still got one can left. That's a prison. That's really a prison to be in. Uh, that's a total lack of freedom. And um, so that mental obsession with drinking, I, I, I have to drink. I, I, I'm never not going to drink because I have to, I need it. And uh, so I thought. And what I didn't know that when, as soon as I took those first couple of drinks, uh, the allergy was triggered and I had to have more. So even though right then and there at the party, once I finished those two cans, 
um, I drank myself silly as I drove home and I continued drinking and that showed me my powerlessness. And um, so for many years I had a checklist which I thought makes me not an alcoholic. I didn't drink in the mornings. I didn't drink every day. Um, Yeah, like I said, I went to work, paid my bills and all these kind of things. But um, my mental and emotional state continued to deteriorate and my drinking continued to get worse. My Jekyll and Hyde uh, personality snaps and erratic moods continued to get worse and worse. And this was the frightening thing. What is wrong with me? How come? How come I can function at work and be okay? And uh, and and I had um, I had been promoted in my job in the last year of my drinking, kind of against my will. I didn't want to be promoted because that means responsibility and commitment and accountability. I just, I just want to lay low and get away with doing the minimum. Don't be pushing me up the ladder. Um, but that's what happened. And um, so I don't know, uh, maybe won't say much more about my drinking other than when I finally hit that last rock bottom, when I realised um, I'd met my match, I can't live with alcohol, I can't live without it, I don't know what to do. I spoke to my mum, my beautiful mum, who's still my rock today. I'm grateful I still have my mum. And I just said, I have a drinking problem. I think I'm an alcoholic. And the floodgates opened. I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and crying. That was my step one. I took step one. I didn't know what step one was. I'd admitted powerlessness. I'd let go completely. I was so beaten. And there's the first paradox of Alcoholics Anonymous, surrender to win. Don't get back in the ring with Mike Tyson ever thinking you're going to beat him. Put up the white flag, surrender. And that's what I did without even knowing it. I'm grateful. Alcohol did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Alcohol beat me into submission. And I'm grateful that my mum was there uh, for me to, to make a start anyway, to take that first step. And she gave me the phone number of an alcohol and drug counselling line. And I rang that line and I said to the guy, I think I might be an alcoholic, which terrified me because I don't want to be an alcoholic. That's the last thing in the world I want to be. And he said, don't be too quick to label yourself. So here's the strange mental twist. Here's the insanity of alcoholism. I've just said, I don't want to be an alcoholic. And when someone suggests to me, oh, don't call yourself an alcoholic, I'm gripped with terror and fear. What is wrong with me then? So I don't know. Somehow I knew I was an alcoholic deep down inside. I knew. I had an idea that it might run in families. I knew my father was an alcoholic. I could look at people and see their behaviour and their drinking. I could tell. I just somehow knew that he's an alcoholic. She's an alcoholic. I felt disgust and contempt for them. And I thought, how do I know they are alcoholics? And the little voice inside me said, it takes one to know one. And that was horrifying because I don't want to be an alcoholic. So anyway, I was hung over, feeling very unwell. And here's this guy saying, oh, don't be too quick to label yourself. And I freaked out. I said, well, what's wrong with me then? I needed to know what's wrong with me. I need an answer. Why? Every time I drink, I, I can't stop. I can't control my behavior. I can't remember what I said, but it would have been something along the lines of whenever I drink, I can't stop. I drink too much. I make a fool of myself. I feel ashamed and embarrassed the next day and I just want to die. And thank God, thank God that man had a little bit of, I don't know what he had, humility, understanding something, because a lot of these counsellors, and I know because I work in this field, I actually work at that very same telephone counselling line today and I'm super super grateful that I get to speak to alcoholics some of them I get to carry the message to some of them do not want to hear it and that's fine I wear a different hat in that job I wear the job that I'm trained and paid for I'm not an AA member there and here I'm not a counsellor I'm a garden variety uh, alcoholic garden variety alcoholic here no different no better, no worse than anyone, just an alcoholic. And it's a beautiful thing just to be one among many, not special, not different, not apart from uh, so different to that experience I had before and the experience I always had before I came to AA. And when I feel like that today, I know it's my ego. 
edging God out. If I'm in my ego, I'm going to be separated from you and I'll be in danger. So the counsellor said, well, why don't you give AA a call? And because I was desperate and the fight had been knocked out of me, the ego and the arrogance had been knocked out of me for that window of opportunity that I rang AA. So the funny mental twist again, here we go. I want them to tell me, no, 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 you're not an alcoholic. You're too young. That's what I wanted to hear. So that's that's how insane I was. I didn't know what was up, what was down. I didn't know what was going on. I'd been beaten, beaten to a pulp by alcohol. Anyway, so I rang Alcoholics Anonymous. So thank God for someone doing step 12 when I was at step one and carrying the message to me. They did not say, yes, you're an alcoholic. No, you're not an alcoholic. They shared their story with me and I identified and I was amazed for the first time in my life ever, I'd heard someone talking honestly about their alcoholism, not minimising, not rationalising, justifying, denying or um, exaggerating or anything. I, I just knew, you know, the language of the heart, you know, when someone's being honest. And I was just blown away by this person. I can't even remember if it was a man or a woman. And I went along to my first meeting. And as I told you there, a spiritual experience happened there. I was greeted at the front again, at the front door again, by someone doing service, someone carrying out the requirement or the responsibility of step 12. They shook my hand, looked into my eyes and welcomed me like a long lost friend. My God. And I remember that as, as if it happened yesterday. And there uh, my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous began and I could admit that I am powerless over alcohol. Yep, 100%. I was ready for that. And um, and I wanted this. I didn't, the funny thing was when I got here, I didn't want to stop drinking. I wanted the problems to go away. I wanted to stop making a fool of myself. I wanted to stop drinking too much. I wanted to stop wrecking my life and my relationships, but I didn't want to stop drinking because I didn't know. All I knew was about not drinking was white knuckling. I'd seen my dad white knuckle and we were all relieved when he, when he drank again. So it was a no-win situation for our family. When he drank, it was a nightmare. When he didn't drink, it was a nightmare. And it was the same for me. I had become like my father. Um, and I had drank everyone out of my life. I was alone. Uh, that was one of the things I thought. I'm not an alcoholic because I don't sit at home alone drinking. I'd seen my father doing that. And my mum told me he didn't always do that. But he'd slowly drank everyone out of his life. And that's where I had been heading. I had one or two very close, loyal friends that somehow stuck by me. And one of them I'm actually going to have dinner with on Saturday night. We used to drink together. She still drinks. We've been in each other's lives for 40 years. And um, we're actually, our birthdays, it's our birthday this week and another friend. We all have our birthdays in January. Neither of them are AA members, but they are two friends who stuck by me. I don't know why. And I'm so grateful to those two women. And I'm still friends with them. One of them I've known, uh, we used to work together for 30 years or whatever. So anyway, this this woman, we've been friends for 40 years and she still drinks. She, I, I, It just blows me away. I see it on Facebook. She's here. She's there. She's having a fun time. Great. Wonderful. I'm happy for her, you know. But me, I couldn't do it. I had to stop. I had to let go. And um, sorry, I've gone off track a little bit. Anyway, um, yeah, so that first meeting, I was grateful they didn't ask me to share because I'm listening around the room and it was like this meeting here, maybe about the same number of people as well, but it was face-to-face. -face. Of course, this was before the internet and everything. People used to sit in the meetings and smoke. We had the banners hung up. They were all yellow and brown from years and years of cigarette smoke. And, uh, yeah, men and women of, of all um, ages and all walks of life and uh, some with long-time sobriety, some newcomers. But there was a woman who said she hadn't had a drink for six years. She wasn't particularly happy on that day, but I knew just by not drinking she had removed a whole heap of problems from her life, drink driving, that, you know, that crazy acting out when you're drunk out at places. And I just remember thinking, I want to be able to say that one day. I want, I want that. I want what she's got. I want freedom from alcohol. 
And uh, I found out here, that, like I said right at the beginning, there's so much more than that on offer here. And there has to be because um, step one tells me I am powerless over alcohol and it's all one, the same idea. For many years, I didn't understand that our lives had become unmanageable. I didn't understand what that meant um, because, and people in meetings talk about not paying their bills, homelessness, unemployment, whatever. I couldn't relate to any of that. Everything was in order. And there's a couple of stories in the big book, Jim and Fred, everything was in order. These men had orderly lives. They were getting on with things. But they had one thing in common, and I have one thing in common. I am powerless over alcohol. So um, I'm going to admit something. For many, many, many years, I didn't understand what unmanageable meant in step one, unmanageability. I thought I did. And I've read it and researched it and listened to people. I think for the first time ever, just tonight, it's finally clicked with me what it is. And there's an AA member. He's from the UK. He's 27 years sober like myself and he writes a blog and I love reading his insights and shares. The way he explained it is this is not a two-part step. This is all about powerlessness and um, hopefully I can explain it so that it may make sense to you because it finally makes sense to me. If I am powerless over alcohol, which I was, I'm not now because I've been given power and the alcohol problem has been removed from me. It's been solved. That's why I say I'm a recovered alcoholic. I live in the Step 10 Promises. I'm a free woman. I can go anywhere I want. I can go to a bar or a nightclub, a dance, a pub, whatever. I can go anywhere I want. I can have alcohol in my house if I want. I have been restored to sanity. And um, there is something I'm just going to quickly read out of the 12 and 12 um, in the forward on page 15, which describes Alcoholics Anonymous and this way of life. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practised as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become, to become happily and usefully whole. I've been restored to wholeness and sanity. I um, There's no triggers out there ever, ever, ever that's going to make me drink. Nothing out there is going to make me drink. It's only going to be inside of me. If I don't maintain my spiritual condition and growth, main, maintenance and growth of my spiritual condition, then I, must, then I may be at risk of drinking. If I'm not practicing this way of life, I put myself at risk of drinking and those things that are my enemies, selfishness, self-seeking, dishonesty, resentment, anger, fear, jealousy, frustration, and my own particular defects, self-righteousness, judging, criticizing, uh, jumping up on my soapbox, whatever that is, uh, self-righteousness, they are the things that are going to drink, uh, make me drink. And um, so powerlessness, I need a power. I have a power greater than myself, and that is where step two came in. Uh, a power greater than myself has restored me to sanity through the process of these steps. And that word san sanity in step two, again, I thought that was, oh, these crazy things that people do when they're drunk. A lot of people do silly things when they're drunk. That's just what happens. Um, but the insanity is that I would ever drink again after what happened last time, after what happened the last 100 times or 99 times that I drank, my mind will go to that one time, that one time back in 1991 when I only had two drinks and went home and nothing bad happened, I'll, my sick mind will cling to that and deny that I'm an alcoholic. And so if I'm powerless, so even though I could manage my life externally, go to work, pay my bills, uh, whatever else I managed to do, I was powerless over alcohol. I was going to drink no matter what. I just didn't know when. And once I drank, because I could, I could stay off it a week, two, three weeks, but the time always came when I drank again. 
And I didn't know that that was because the mental obsession was driving me because I'm an alcoholic. I thought it was because I wanted to. I've had a good week at work. I've had a bad week at work. I thought these rationalizations, justifications and excuses for drinking, I thought I was choosing to drink. I wasn't. Alcoholism was driving me to drink. And um, and then what happens is the phenomenon of craving kicks in. The unquenchable thirst, the abnormal reaction to alcohol. And so just for the sake of, um, so in step one in the 12 and 12, I'm, I'm into the big book more, but for some reason I've, I've gone into the 12 and 12 tonight. Page 22, relentlessly deepening our dilemma, our sponsors pointed out our increasing sensitivity to alcohol, an allergy they called it. The tyrant alcohol wielded a double-edged sword over us. First, we were smitten by an insane urge that condemned us to go on drinking, the mental obsession, and then by an allergy of the body that ensured we would ultimately destroy ourselves in the process. And that's what makes my life unmanageable. Alcoholism and alcohol is calling the shots. So I can't really guarantee what's going to happen because I don't know if I'm going to drink again or not. And that's my understanding of unmanageability because people can have um, unmanageability in their lives and not be alcoholics. Uh, it's it's so I don't know if I've really explained that well and but I feel like finally I'm starting to understand unmanageability and I thought it was the bedevilments I thought it was other things but step one's not a two-part step it's not two different things it's all about my powerlessness over alcohol um, alcohol was a power greater than me which has now been re replaced by um, uh, the god of my understanding and I've been restored to sanity. And I forgot to put my timer on. Usually I'm very diligent about putting my timer on. Um, so I've got no idea where I'm at. My apologies. It must be almost time, I think. I think you're at um, about 30, about five or 10 more minutes or 15 if you'd like. Oh, okay, wonderful. Thanks, Stephen. So I'm, I'm probably at the end of it. I um, just want to say again, welcome anyone who's new, especially to the fellow here at your first meeting. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience or thing. And, and I'm grateful and I'm fortunate because, like I said, I was beaten. Um, my vocabulary changed from I know, I know, I know, I know to I don't know, I don't know, and just sobbing and crying uncontrollably in meetings because I was so broken. Thank God. Thank God for that. And I'm grateful for any opportunity I get to talk about AA and share about AA because I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I owe my very life to Alcoholics Anonymous because I had plan B and this always sounds so dreadful and dramatic, but it's my story. I had plan B as I was going off to that first meeting on that Saturday night, I had plan B. If I don't like these people, which was highly likely because I hated you, hated me, hated everyone, what a sad, horrible place to be. Spiritual bankruptcy, complete spiritual poverty and bankruptcy. Plan B, I am going to throw myself under a train. I can't do this anymore. And sadly, uh, many alcoholics do die uh, through through accidents, overdoses on other drugs, uh, yeah, suicide, um, organ failure, all kinds of things. So the fact that I'm, I'm just alive, I'm living on borrowed time. I had a couple of near misses. There was one near miss when I was about 16. I'd been in a nightclub and uh, the fellow who was driving, um, he'd fallen asleep at the wheel. Um, somehow I'd managed to grab the wheel. We'd been headed straight, straight for a telegraph pole. I don't even remember that because the following week he looked at me as if he'd seen a ghost and he mentioned something about it. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He told me what had happened. So there was that. And we know there are many people who sadly um, die in accidents, car accidents and all kinds of things from, from alcoholism and, and being getting in cars with uh, drink drivers and so on. And, and I, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous and I threw myself into it. 90 meetings in 90, 90, meetings in 90 days was suggested. I did that and um, I questioned that 
because my ego came back and I started to say, hang on a minute, I didn't even drink every day. Why should I do a meeting every day? And I was told, look, if you if you put half as much energy into this as you did into your drinking, you will succeed. So I gave that some thought and I was told, um, give it a three-month trial period and if you're not happy with it, your misery will be gladly refunded to you in full. And so there was a there was a few brain cells left in there to have some rational thought. And I realised, well, actually, alcoholism or my drinking has robbed me of 12 years. And I know today it didn't rob me of anything. That's my greatest asset. So, but anyway, if 12 years went to alcohol, surely I could give this a go for three months. And look, I've got money. I'm legal age to drink. If I want to drink, go and drink. And I did end up seeing a drug and alcohol counsellor for a while and he wanted to teach me how to drink. And he said, look, nobody ever taught you how to drink properly. You learned to drink with other teenagers who also didn't know how to drink. And he showed me on his whiteboard how the body can only metabolise one drink per hour. That sounds like torture to me. One drink per hour? No, I'm, I'm thirsty. Like I need to drink fast and a lot and quickly and I need to get the effect and um, and I said to him, look, I tried to get him to come along to AA because it's so wonderful. And I said, look, I can tell you many, many people who were just like me, who are now sober and happy and not drinking, and I understand confidentiality, but I said to this counsellor, can you tell me of anyone that, you know, has overcome a drinking problem? And he said, oh, there is one guy you know, he was going along okay, but then he busted, you know, and it was that stuff. He was lonely or something. Isn't that the craziest thing? I drink because I'm lonely. Um, alcohol made me lonely. It cut me off and um, wrecked my relationships. Anyway, I said to this counsellor, maybe that guy could come to AA. He said, no, 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 he doesn't like groups. He doesn't like groups. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. And I threw myself into the literature. I was told, read the big book. That, that was the most important piece of info. Well, one, there was a lot of important information, but um, read the big book. So I got the big book and read that. I was lucky. Again, I had been a bookworm before I picked up alcohol. And, um, and I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous when I heard the history of it, how it came to be, this broken down uh, stockbroker who had been absolutely hopeless, hopeless, in and out of detox and hospitals, uh, they'd given up on him. Everyone had lost hope through a series of events, came in touch with this doctor in Akron. Because of these two meeting back in uh, June 1935 or May 1935, you're here and I'm here. And that, that just blows me away. And when I realised that, it was like, wow, I am part of this miracle. I get to be part of this thing. And uh, doc, like Dr. Bob said, when you take these um, these principles or these steps and traditions, I can't, I don't know exactly how to quote it, but um, simmer down, uh, th this can be summarised in two words, love and service. So if I get confused, if I start to think I don't understand it, it's all too confusing, it's all too much, he said this, she said that, I just need to remember it's about love and service and if I try to walk in love and in service uh, on a daily basis in my life, then that's a good start. So even though sometimes I think I'm going to be lost for words, there are times when I talk the same way I drank. Once I start, I can't stop. So I'm going to leave it there because I'd really love to hear um, other people's experience, strength and hope also. So thanks again, Gordon, for inviting me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. God bless. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.